I understand that you've come out here to learn about what it's like to carve up the pie of equity and ownership in startup. So we're going to do that today. Uh, as we start to walk through the material, uh, I'd like to just let you know that we're going to focus on something. Who here knows that I'm a lawyer? OK, good, good. So we're going to focus more on the legal aspects. That is not necessarily the size of the pie, although we'll talk about that and the size of the slices that the pie is getting cut up. But we're going to focus on the tools that you're going to use to cut it up, make sure it's cut up properly, and make sure it's served properly. Because those things will get you just as much, if not more, than figuring out the actual size of the slices. All right, so I'd like to give a road map uh, for all these presentations to let you guys know where it is that we're going to go. Uh, we're going to start with my backgrounds. We're going to then also talk a little bit about your background. I want to know who the audience is. I want to try and be able to tweak what it is I'm going to say and customize it for you guys so that it's um, informative and worth your time. Uh, we'll talk about the sort of size of the slice issue. Excuse me. We're going to talk about the big picture. Okay. I find often when I do these, uh, these kinds of presentations, there's a various um, level of sophistication of the audience members. We're going to take it down to nuts and bolts, kind of start with some of the basics before you even think about cut cutting up the slice. And then we're going to talk about how big each person's slice should be a little bit. Then we're going to talk about the documentation that you need. Okay, this is getting back to our sort of slicing analogy. This is, you know, what knife you should be cutting with, what plate you should be serving on, uh, whether or not you're going to want to have some whipped cream with that, whether or not it should be ice cream. We're then going to put everything all together and kind of big picture it, and we'll do a, a nice hypothetical. And then if we have time, we'll talk about some common pitfalls that we see. And then we'll open up the, the stage for your questions. And as Rob said, Hold your questions to the end. We'll have you come up. You'll say them into the microphone, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. The other thing is that I'm not mic'd. Okay, this is for the audio for the video. So if you can't hear me in the back, raise your hands, and I'll speak louder. But right now, can you hear me in the back? Yes. yes. Awesome. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into it. All right, so who am I? Well, I'm a corporate and securities attorney. I've been here in the Bay Area for the last eight years. I've had my own practice for four years. Before that, I worked for a very large law firm working with large technology companies. What do we do? Well, we focus on the needs of startups and mid-stage companies. So where you guys are right now, that's what we do. Uh, I'm licensed, because I'm a glutton for punishment, I'm licensed here in California, uh, DC, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts. I've sat for five bar exams. It's, after you get through the first one, they're not so tough. Um, I love working with early stage entrepreneurs. We do that a lot. We work a lot with experienced entrepreneurs. That is, you know, they've successfully exited their first startup. They come back. They're looking for a shop that can add a lot of value, um, provide a lot of strategic advice without costing them an arm, an arm and a leg. That's what we do. Uh, and I love to skydive in my spare time. So I have like a thousand skydives, and I compete in that. All right, so here's the active portion. When I ask a question, please raise your hand. Who here is in a startup? Fantastic. And who's thinking about founding one? Good. OK, you've come to the right place. Who's done a startup before? OK, and who, who had a successful exit of those hands that were raised? Good. Who had an unsuccessful exit? And who learned a lot? Same guys. That's right. Entrepreneurship is a skill. OK, so you can make mistakes, but you got to learn from them. Bottom line, you got to push forward. Nobody's perfect. Same skills that it takes to be an entrepreneur um, is a different set of skills than it takes sometimes to manage a very large organization. So um, you know, just because you're good at one doesn't mean you'll be good at the other. And, just be, and it goes both ways. One other public service announcement. If you have a phone, please turn it off or turn it to silent. I get distracted easily. And no shiny objects. All right, so I wouldn't be a lawyer if I didn't give you a, a warning or a caveat. And that is basically what we're going to talk about today is general information. Okay, so that means whatever we discuss, whether it's I'm up here or afterwards, okay, maybe we have a conversation afterwards, or maybe I'm addressing a question because you've asked it at one of the you know, Q&A sessions at the end. Okay, that's general information. Okay, there are rules, there are exceptions to rules, there are exceptions to the exceptions. And then sometimes, in order to give a good answer, actually most of the time in order to give a good answer, you need to have 
a lot of facts, okay? And we're not gonna have time to go into the facts for everything. So, kind of with that in mind, um, don't take anything as legal advice, okay? You need to work with a specific attorney who's good and focuses in this area in order to get an answer, and it'll probably take more information than you can um, convey back and forth in 10 or 15 minutes. All right, so let's move into the big picture, okay? This is this fantastic, I, I actually don't have a background in, um, uh, in graphic design, as you can probably tell. But here's the big picture, right? You're entrepreneurs, you're fa you're, you want to start a company, and you want a company that increases in value. Well, why is that? Because if it doesn't increase in value, it's not going anywhere, nobody's going to invest in it, you're going to have to go back to whatever you were doing before you started doing this project. So the company is sort of like the linchpin, or it's sort of like the... Um, Hmm. It's the hopper in which you put all these inputs and it grows, okay? If you do it correctly, it grows, okay? So you start out with the idea, right? Somebody, maybe it's you, maybe it's your colleague, maybe it's both of you working together, have an idea for a product, a good or a service, um, you know, whether it's technological or whether or not it, it, you know, is a delivery of services. You have these ideas and you want those to vest in the company, okay? Additionally, Ideas are fantastic, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, but ideas aren't as valuable sometimes as the execution, okay? Let me give you an example. Was Google the first search engine? Yeah. No, okay? It's not like they came up with the idea of the search engine. They came up with the idea of a better search engine. They were able to execute on that. So when we talk about ideas versus execution, they're probably, for every startup there is out there right now, or for every idea, there's probably you know, there are multiple competing startups even on that idea. And then even aside from that, there are probably other people with the same ideas that are out there circulating. To give you an example, um, you know, a couple years ago when Uber and Lyft and Sidecar were all, um, you know, were, I mean, they're still super hot, but they were kind of just hitting the press. I can't tell you how many calls I got by entrepreneurs who had ideas for ride sharing um, apps. Okay, that's fine. You can do it as long as you do it better than anybody else. Now, you can't build what it is you're trying to build by yourself, or at least not to scale, okay? Not for startups. What we're talking about is, is companies that are emerging growth companies. Who knows what that is? Okay, right, that's a company that's going to grow and disrupt the market either by bringing a new good or service to market, or by disrupting the current service model that's in place. But it will take a lot of capital to grow and scale, okay? We're not talking about the conversation today is about emerging growth companies. It's not about um, a, you know, a company that's gonna, that's gonna mature at a, you know, a $10 million a year annual revenue. You know, we're looking at least 100, 200, 300 million plus. So you, you need more than just one person or a couple of founders in order to do that. You're gonna need to add other people, okay? And those people add services, those are technicians. They have skills like legal, accounting, sales, marketing, okay? Maybe you have um, other kinds of product engineers involved. And they need to have all of the intellectual property that they develop get put into the company. Okay, and when you do that, the company starts to achieve value and people are willing to invest in it. So here's sort of the big picture and we're gonna kind of come back to this throughout our talk today. All right, so foundational backgrounds. Well, before you can start talking about how you're gonna carve up ownership, you gotta figure out what it is that you're actually gonna be carving up, okay? So entity choice, okay? as well as what's the form of ownership of that entity. Oh, excuse me, okay. So in the foundational basics, we're gonna talk about what type of entity you need, what's the form of ownership, because this is a really common mistake that I see time and time again, as well as what pre and post money valuations are and what they mean for ownership, okay? All right, so what kind of entity is it that, you know, we're talking about when we're talking about emerging growth companies, okay? Usually, we're talking about Delaware C corporations, okay? The reason why we're talking about that and why, why we choose, and I'm just gonna go briefly into this, why Delaware C Corp, is that Delaware is a very business-friendly state, okay? <laughs> Ultimately, what your goal is, is to have a successful exit, right? And so, how do you exit? Sell or IPO. Right, M&A or IPO, okay? In order to get to that stage, you gotta get money in 
typically from venture capitalists. Okay, in order to be attractive to venture capitalists, what do you need? You need to have a vehicle that's attractive to them. Okay, why is a Delaware C Corp generally more attractive to them than, let's say, an LLC? A couple reasons. One, venture capitalists are going to want to have some control over their investments, so they're going to want to have folks who are on the board of directors. Okay, so that means they're going to want to have kind of more liability protections for them. So Delaware offers that. The pass-through tax entity isn't particularly great for venture funds, which are generally set up as LPs. They're pass-through entities themselves. So they don't want to have to take the losses and pass them through um, you know, on a year-by-year on -year basis for their clients. Are you guys following me? Is this getting boring? or no. no? All right, good. Usually I ask questions, but today we're going to, or excuse me, I answer questions throughout the presentation. But today, since we have such a large group, we're putting it to the end. So, All right. Um, I will tell you, having worked with both the Delaware Secretary of State's office and the California Secretary of State's office, Delaware is the bomb. Okay, they get back to you so much quicker than California does. Um, and you think, oh, well, who cares, right? I mean, it's the Secretary of State, you're just pushing paper through. Well, time counts, okay, when, especially if you're doing M&A work, which we do. Um, you need to have documents turned around quickly. And that can make or break you, so even kind of a smaller a smaller item like that really can kind of um, add up at the margin. All right, I think we got through everything on there. All right, this is one of the biggest mistakes I've seen by entrepreneurs, especially first time entrepreneurs. Okay, so if you have a company, all right, and we're talking about a Delaware C Corp here, the ownership of that company is represented by shares of stock. Okay, it's not percentages. Does that make sense to everybody? Does everybody already know that and I'm just preaching to the choir? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The reason why I say that is I can't tell you the number of times people come into my office and say, well, I have 50% of this company and, and Jill has 40% of this company and Bob has 10% of this company and Bob is no longer getting along and we want to kick him out. Well, what are we going to do? And I say, well, how many shares does Bob have? And he says, uh, one, of the, you know, one of the founders says, well, we haven't issued shares. Okay. Your formation isn't complete until you've completely gone through and issued shares. Okay. And you need to make sure you're complying with the securities laws when you do that. But the point is, talking about corporations, you're talking about the number of shares that people have. Okay. That sets what's the numerator and the denominator. So let me just go through some of this language for you. Who here knows what this, uh, the Articles of Incorporation are? Just raise your hand. Good. In there, you will see that the type of stock or the authorized number of shares of stock are listed, right? And it'll say 10 million shares of common stock are authorized. OK, that's it. It's just stock sitting can be issued. It's not issued. OK. When you have your founders come in, let's say they're, um, Let's take a step back. Let's use because we're going to use these numbers later in the hypo. I want to make it easy. Let's say the authorized number of shares is are 20 million. Okay. Let's say you have four founders. Each founder gets 2.5 million shares. So you got 10 million shares now outstanding. Okay. You can still talk about percentage of ownership for each of those founders as 25 percent, but know that what you're talking about is the 2.5 million shares they have over the 10 million issued shares. Well, there are 20 million authorized, 10 million unauthorized, and 10 million issued. So you, you ignore the 20 million part when you're talking about the, the actual shares that are um, the, we're talking about percentage of ownership. OK, who here has heard of valuation? OK, pre-money, post-money. Good. All right. Well. If you're unaware of it, you should be aware of it because this is very important when it comes to uh, terms of financing. All right. So pre-money, it seems very easy, and it, it is, but you've got to get through it a couple times. So simply put, pre-money valuation is the value of the, of the company before the round of investment and before the amount, the, you know, that financing round puts the money into the company. So for example, oh, we have an example down below. Now, 
Determining the actual value of a company is very difficult in a startup. Okay, why? Because generally there are not a lot of comp uh, comparables out there. Um, and really, especially at the very early stages, when we're talking about having two, three, four founders, maybe a couple of early employees, there may be no revenue. They may not e you may not even have a lot of traction or a lot of users. All right. So it's a little bit more art than science. And consequently, this is frequently why, who here has heard of convertible debt or convertible equity? This is actually why convertible debt and convertible equity is generally used at the sort of seed stage, okay? The reason for that is it avoids putting actual value on the company at the time that that money is put in because it's too hard to tell. The, the value of the company is really the team and, and how they will execute that idea over the next 6, 10, 12, 24 months or whatever it is that they're going to be putting into it. So that's hard to do. So that's one reason why convertible debt and convertible equity get issued at the seed stage. Um, and you avoid that valuation issue. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, uh, are, I've heard of caps, and aren't caps actually valuations? And the answer is no. Uh, and we can talk about that at some point later. So post money is the money that is the value of the company after the financing has been put into the company. So let's use an example. Let's say you have a pre-money valuation of $10 million and an investment of $3 million. So remember we were talking about shares and it being, you can, you can talk about percentage ownership, you just have to realize that what you're talking about is the number of shares that a particular person holds over the number of shares that are authorized. So you can still talk about Founder A having 33% of the company, okay? So let's just say, um, you know, in my example before, there are 10 million outstanding shares. Founder A would have 3.33 million shares. Well, you can see after the money gets put in, the value of A shares are probably going to be 25%, right? Because what we're talking about is um, an increase in in the value of the company. And, and what happens actually is that the, the preferred shareholders, or excuse me, the investors are gonna get preferred stock. So the, the denominator, that is the number of outstanding shares, goes up by, in this case, you know, roughly 3,333,000 shares. Does this make sense? People's eyes are kind of glazing over. Yeah. All right, so now that we've kind of talked about some of these basics, and we'll come back to it, we should talk about, uh, we should talk about the next stage, which is, well, who gets what, okay? I'm sure that's what all, everybody is really interested in. Well, I will tell you this. In my experience, there is no magic bullet for determining this, okay? There's no particular right or wrong. There's not a black or white, okay? Um, there's not a, set an, not a set answer. There are an infinite number of ways to basically do it. But it is very, very important. So what you need to do is you need to think about what is right for your company. And there is a lot of information out there. Um, I generally, when I talk to clients, and I don't provide specific recommendations, but you know, we talk about things like whose idea is it, who will be doing the most contributions, who's going to be putting in the, the most amount of cash. And there's a real balancing act. Okay. There's a balancing act between all these tensions. And if you go through, there are some resources online, like for example, founders.com has a calculator where you, you put in basically, uh, there may be 20 different questions along the lines of what I've just sort of discussed in terms of <clears throat> who's contributing the most, who's going to be CEO, who's going to be CFO, who's, who's given up this job, who's done that thing. And, and they, will, they will provide a recommendation. Now. I'm not championing, championing, I'm not supporting founders.com. Um, I'm just saying that it's out there. And if you just do a few searches, you'll come across many, many different ideas and folks who have ideas out there. Um, additionally, you know, events like this, especially if they're hosted by, you know, former founders, they can talk about what their experiences were, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, okay? I think those are really great resources all throughout here in the Valley. And anybody who tells you that they have a specific, um, specific answer for you without really kind of diving into the details, 
they're not really, they're doing you a disservice. It's kind of like figuring out what's the right, uh, the right carve up for everybody. It's a little bit almost like doing evaluation on a startup, okay? It's difficult, it's a little bit more art than science, um, and you gotta kinda take a holistic perspective. So let's move on. All right, so just to say one, one other thing. Carving up those slices is really a business decision. It's not a decision that your lawyer should be making for you. That's maybe another thing that I want to add. So that's why I said that you, know, you, you need to really do your own diligence and dig into who should get what um, for yourselves. And you should be comfortable with it. Now, once you've, you've made that decision in terms of getting back to the actual carving and which which uh, knives you should use and, and settings you should use to serve it. There are some real key things that if you don't get into place, they can really sink your battleship. Okay, one is vesting. Who here has heard of vesting? Okay. For those who did not raise your hand, I'm gonna to explain to you briefly what vesting is. <clears throat> so let's go back to our example where there are four founders and they each have 2.5 million shares. The concept of vesting is basically this, and it's a little bit of a misnomer. I'm going to start with the sort of backwards part forward, which is that with vesting, you kind of get all, okay. With vesting, you earn your shares over time or some other metric, okay? Typically for founders, it's time. You want to make sure they have a right commitment. We're talking about usually three year, excuse me, three or four years with a one year cliff. Okay, and a cliff is a period of time where if you leave, you get nothing. Um, if you stay past that cliff, generally the stock will vest, uh, it will continue vesting, you know, over monthly increments until the rest of the period is basically up. So at the end of year one, everybody gets 25%. Each month thereafter, they get roughly 2% of what it is that they're owned or that they're owed. Now, I say it's a little bit of a misnomer because everybody talks about vesting as being like, you know, you're earning your equity over time. But the way that these agreements are set up, it's a little bit different. I, I like to think of it as more like you get all of your shares up front, but they have strings attached, like various levels of strings connected with each point in time and that's going to vest. And what happens is, as time goes by, a string gets cut. And then another string gets cut. So basically, initially, those founders that we were talking about before, they get credit for 2.5 million shares of stock each, okay? And if they have a, a one-year cliff, if they leave within the one year, they get nothing. If they leave on the one-year anniversary, they, you know, the string that holds 25% is cut, and so they walk away at that 25%. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, there are a couple other important things to think about when you're signing an investing agreement or you're getting an investing agreement in place, and that is acceleration. No, it's not important. Don't give it. No, don't give it. Well, you know, I think the answer really sort of depends. It's worth thinking about, okay, because there are two different kinds of, of acceleration, or there are two generally two different kinds of acceleration. Um, you know, the concept of acceleration is this, which is that if an event happens during your vesting period, all of those strings get cut at once, okay? So you walk away with the full 2.5 million shares. The, the issue kind of about that is, you know, you don't necessarily want that event, to, you want all of everybody's incentives to be lined up. So typically an event that would do that is the founder gets let go, okay? Well, well, that sounds terrible. If they got let go, then they really shouldn't walk away with anything. Well, it sort of depends. Okay, if they've been with the team and they have built enough value that that there's been a successful exit, that is, the company is getting sold, you know, through M and A to a um, to a larger company. Well, maybe you want that acceleration triggered so that they can pick up all that value um, during that M and A deal. So that's one thing to think about. Um, and typically, you know, that's the single trigger acceleration. A double trigger would re be required if, well, not only you know, have they gotten picked up or not only has this M&A happened, but they've been lot, let go um, without cause. And frequently, who, who here is familiar with for and without cause? Yeah. So 
right? For cause, that means you've generally you've done something bad or something that was inappropriate. Um, without cause just means being let go for any reason. So those are some of the things that you want to be thinking about as you're moving through these vesting agreements and schedules. Now, the other thing to think about when you're doing vesting, which we always talk about, is the 83B election. Does anyone know what an 83B election is? No, good, you've come to the right place. <clears throat> so an 83B election is really a tax issue. And what it is is that the IRS, and I'm not a tax attorney, but I'll just sum it up for you. The IRS basically takes the position of this. Whenever you receive something of value, if you haven't paid fair market value for it, you gotta pay tax on the difference between what you paid for it and what its value is. Okay, so where that comes up in this point is, generally when founders are issuing stock to themselves or when the company is issuing stock to the founders, the founders are purchasing that stock for $0.0001 per share, basically a thousandth of a penny. And they're saying, well, the fair market value of that stock is a thousandth of a penny because all we have is some ideas on a whiteboard and there's been no execution, okay? The issue is, the IRS takes the position, is it's when you actually get the property. In this case, we're talking about the stock. So we're kind of going to go back to the opposite side of the way that I like to think of it, which is the strings cut. The IRS basically takes the position as vesting is kind of like you get a piece of equity over time. So what happens is, over time, presumably, the company is building in value and growing. So that, that piece of that stock, that share of stock that you received or would have received on the first day that you founded the company, two years later might be worth a dollar per share. Okay? And the IRS basically says two years in, well, you're getting that share of stock. It's really worth a, a dollar, but you paid for it only a thousandth of a penny. So we're going to tax you on the 99 cents per share. Does anyone get this? So, if you got like 2.5 million shares and the stock is now worth five or 10 bucks a share, we're talking about serious tax liability, you know, tax liability on $10 million or something like that. So <clears throat> very crucial, it's pretty much impossible to fix if you blow your 83B election and you have to file that within 30 days of the stock issuance. <coughs> now, I want to talk about something that comes up all the time in startups. Okay, and this is, this is going to come up in the area of founder ownership and carving up the pie. It's going to come up when you're talking about the ownership of your initial investors. It's going to come up when you're talking about the ownership of your employees. Or I'm going to just kind of maybe move back into the ideal spot. Sorry, Tim. Um, You're only as good as the deal that you can cut today. You're not as good as the deal you could cut yesterday. You may or may not be as good as the deal you can cut tomorrow. So what that basically means is, is that anything that you do, later on if you're trying to get another round of financing, the investors may require that it be changed or altered later. Okay, what does that mean? That means that, and I had a question today that came into me through the email, and I just sort of answered generally. Let's say you started a startup in 2010, and you just worked on it with two friends, and it took you, and you got vesting in place. You got four, you, you had, you know, four years vesting with a one-year cliff, okay? But here we are in 2015, and you're finally in a position that you can get investment by, uh, let's say, an institutional investor, like a venture capitalist. The investor is investing in what you are building today and what the company is be, going to be worth tomorrow. They don't care what happened in the past. So to the extent your investing may have already happened and may have already accrued, they may make the financing contingent upon you re-subjecting your shares to vesting. So you may have to start all over again. Or maybe you'll get some credit, okay? You may get some credit. You may be able to negotiate that. But any deal that you kind of cut and get on paper now is subject to renegotiation later. Does that make sense? That also happens for, your, you know, for the other folks who acquire equity or who invest in your company. So for example, the convertible debt holders. Okay, I've seen founders, you know, before they come to me, they've cut 
a very generous deal with maybe like a 50 or 70% discount rate on the, on the convertible note that they did. Well, the, the next round of investors aren't going to want to be able to allow them to participate at such a high discount, and so that's going to have to get negotiated. So just so you know, whatever it is that you do today may be up for grabs in the future as well, especially if you have a down round. So what are some of the other things that you need to get in place? You know, what's the sort of a la mode or the whipped cream that you need to put on this pie? Well, you want to have potentially rights of first refusal uh, between the founders okay, and other equity holders, as well as co-sale rights and drag-along rights. Does anybody know what any of those things are? OK, good. You've come, oh, one person. <clears throat> well, you've come to the right place. So rights of first refusal, people frequently probably will have heard of this either in real estate or, or something along those lines, which is basically a right of first refusal gives you the ability to, the first, to be the first person to acquire a piece of property. In this case, we're talking about the shares of another founder. So your co-founder can't go out and then sell his shares or her shares to anybody else. They got to come to you first. Now, granted, typically we build in there a mechanism to try and value the shares so that um, the vested shares are subject to, uh, the vested shares will get paid out at the appropriate rate. Um, but you want to make sure that your competitor doesn't get your shares or you know, somebody who you really don't like ends up on, in the company. Co-sale rights. So that's the right, basically, that if you, let's say nobody wants to exercise their first, their rights of first refusal. But nonetheless, they found a ready, willing, and able buyer to purchase the shares. Let me take a step back. Who here has heard of liquidity? All right. So liquidity is, it's getting, it's getting cash, OK? It's turning those shares of stock into the dollars that you need in order to pay for your kid's tuition or you need to purchase a house. And it is a real problem for founders because they've left the, typically you know, they've left a well-paying job where they're, not, they're, they're in the startup and not necessarily being paid well. Okay? And they've got stock in a company which may or may not be successful, so you don't have any cash. So co-sale rights helps fix some of this issue so that if you know, one of your co-founders is able to sell his or her shares, you have the right to sell the same proportion of your shares and also get liquidity. So it's not just that your co-founder can get it, but you can have some as well. And drag-along rights are important, especially you know, when it comes to the M&A context, which is that you don't want to have any holdout founders when it comes time to sell you know, because you want to have a successful exit. So drag-along rights are rights that allow you to drag along or bring along another co-founder or another stockholder um, into a sale of the shares of stock. The other thing that I want to mention with vesting, which I forgot before, is in the vesting agreement, when we're talking about cutting the strings and leaving early, we're talking about the shares that haven't vested getting repurchased by the company, and they go back basically into the stock pool. And they get purchased at the price that they were paid for, which is typically a hundredth or a thousandth of a penny. So why is that important? Well, it's important because you don't want the company to have to pay top dollar to cash out your co-founder, because you probably don't have the cash. Or the company doesn't have the cash to do that. That's good. All righty. Well, we're making good progress. So let's kind of put it all together and talk about hypos. All right, so we talked about this a little bit earlier. And I put a timeline on here to make it a little bit simple. But let's say you have four founders and you all got together in January 2010. And let's say there are a total of 20 million authorized shares. And each founder, let's say you decide to carve up the pie, you know, one quarter each. And that's very typical. It's not necessarily always the right thing to do, but it's very typical. And let me also just add that and it kind of goes back to the, the concept of renegotiation. It's probably better to err on the side of granting a little bit less e equity, because if people are putting in, are you having trouble hearing me? No, no, I just have a question. 
Okay. We're holding all questions until, until we wrap up, just for the ease of presentation, but I'd, I'd love to take it after that. Okay. Um, if everybody agree, okay, so it's always sometimes a little bit better to, grab a, to grant a little bit rest, less equity to folks, because if someone does put in a good effort, you can always grant more. It's much harder to take shares of stock away, and frequently it's kind of impossible to do, and people don't enjoy it. So, but let's say they decide to do straight down the middle split, which is pretty typical, and one founder leaves six months in. Who here knows how much that founder gets? Zero. Now, as I've always said, whatever it is that you've done is oftentimes subject to renegotiation. So it's possible, maybe that person really put in a fantastic effort, okay? And you want to, and they know that they can't walk away with anything, but they come to you um, and they say, look, I put in this big effort and then, you know, unfortunately I had a parent pass away or it was very sick and I have to go take care of them. You know, you don't have to be cold blooded. You can give them maybe all the shares that they would have otherwise earned. So basically credit for six months, or maybe you can negotiate three months or maybe it's not right. I don't know. Maybe that person was just a terrible person who didn't put in any effort whatsoever and they should get zero. These are the options that you have, okay? But that's one of the nice things about having the cliff in place is that it gives the company the option. It doesn't give the, uh, the, the founder who walked away, you know, either all of their shares or, you know, the equivalent of, uh, what would that be? Uh, 800,000 shares or whatever it is. All right, so let's continue on a little bit with our hypothetical. So you've done a convertible rounds a year later with $500,000. There's a 20% discount and there's no cap. Okay, we're, this hypo is based off of simplicity. So we're going to, we're going to kind of keep it simple so you guys can kind of see how things sort of shake out. Uh, let's say you've also got some employees. Um, and the option pool was uh, 2.5 million as well. Okay, so you created an option pool in June of 2011, and at that point in time, employees had exercised their options. So basically, you know, they got these options and they were entitled to, to pay for the shares and then actually get shares. All right, so we're now two years into the company, and you're going to do an A round for 4.4 million in funding. Okay, and the pre-money valuation is going to be 10 million. And in this, this is this is the sort of ease of ease of simplicity hypo. They're going to allow your convertible notes to be included in the post-money valuation. So basically, they're going to count the the convertible notes as coming in in the round. Sometimes they do that. They'll do that especially if you still have money left in the bank from that round of fi financing. But it makes the calculation just a lot simpler here. So basically. Before the financing, we're talking about a $10 million company. Okay? Now you can convert, as I said earlier, you can convert the number of shares that people have into a percentage ownership. Okay? And we do that right here. So initially there were four founders, but one left and they didn't, they walked away with nothing. Okay? So the three remaining founders each have 2.5 million shares. So together they have 7.5 million shares. Um, maybe my math is off here. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, they should, I'm sorry, that shouldn't be 50%. That should be, I think, 75%. Hold on, wait, let me see. I was tinkering with this earlier. Oh, I'm sorry, I was looking, I was looking at the lower part. My bad. Yeah, so they have 75%. Now, you have an option pool. Who here knows what the option pool is? Okay. An option pool is something that, you know, and people ask me, well, when do I get an option pool in place? Well, the answer is you know, it just sort of depends on what's the right circumstances for your company. Initially, if, if it's just you and a, a couple other founders working, I, I recommend waiting to get an option pool in place. You don't necessarily need it right away. It adds some expense. Additionally, you can't, or it is imprudent, to start granting options until you can do a 409A valuation. Okay, the 409A valuation is based off of the IRS's rules. It goes back to the whole concept that if people are receiving property, in this case, an option. They need to be paying you know, fair market value for it. 
um, and they need to pay fair market value for the right for the option and for the stock that would um, vest to them if they exercised. Um, and so anyway, what the, fair, the 409A valuation does is it basically puts a, a price per share on the stock so that you have a placeholder. You have an outside objective observer stating that the value of the stock is X. Okay, and that allows, that allows employees to avoid getting taxed and hosed. <clears throat> so you have two million remaining in the option pool and there are employees out there with 500,000 shares total. Okay, so that gives them 5% of the company. Now, post money, the numbers change, right? So $5 million, yes, so $5 million comes in in this round, right? It's 4.4 for the A round investors, okay? And then the convertible note holders get credit, right? They had a 20% discount, so they're basically getting credit at 20%. So that's, that's how you get 20% of 500,000 is 600,000. Does that make sense? All right. Um, so you can see how everybody's percentage of ownership has changed. <clears throat> the, the three founders still have 7.5 million shares among them. But they, they now are equal to basically 50% of the company. The exercise shares also dropped to 3.3%, and the option pool is at 13% instead of um, 20. Exactly. And the same for the convertible note holders, they got 4% and the investors have 29.33%. Okay, so did anybody have any questions on that? Because it was quick, no. So common pitfalls. So very common pitfall that we see is not forming the right entity. So frequently people will, will set up LLCs Okay, and we can convert them, we can fix that, that's not a problem. Okay, but LLCs are not really designed, um, they're not designed to do stock options, okay? LLCs are basically partnerships. That's kind of the best way to think about it. They're basically partnerships with liability protection on them. So they're set up to run flexibly. You can put in all the things that a corporation has into an LLC, but doing that really just makes it a lot more expensive to run, you should just run a corporation to begin with. That's what we say. So. Not forming an entity or not forming the right entity. Let, let me also just say one of the real problems with not forming an entity whatsoever is twofold. One, if we go back to the really nice graphic that I had at the beginning of this program, the IP, the ideas, the money is not vesting in the company. It's just, it's vesting basically in this uh, unincorporated partnership, which is a nightmare. Two, it means that things are probably not really documented very well, so somebody could walk away with a big chunk of equity. And three, if and when you go to incorporate, who here has heard of, okay, C Corps being treated as fictitious people? Yeah, of course, this is the big like, Supreme Court case. They, um, they're basically treated as separate, as separate people. So to the extent you're giving or selling property to the corporation, Again, that rule that I said comes up. The corporation needs to pay fair market value or needs to exchange fair market value for that property. So if you're trying to give $2.5 million of intellectual property to a corporation, the corporation needs to pay $2.5 million for it, which means in order for the corporation to pay $2.5 million, when you buy your shares from the company, you got to put in $2.5 million so they can just turn around and buy it back. I know it sounds ludicrous, but that's the way that it is. Um, other problems are not getting investing agreements in place or not, uh, not exercising repurchases in time. Okay, so as I said before, vesting means that the way I like to think of vesting is basically the founders get credit for all their shares up front. That means they get voting rights. They would get dividends if there were any, but there probably aren't going to be any because there's not going to be any cash flow for a while. Um, so they get those rights. And as time goes by, the strings get cut so they can't, so when they walk away, they can walk away with all of it. If you don't get the, so if you walk away, the company needs to repurchase those shares. They do that by exercising the repurchase option in the repurchase agreement. Um, 
Typically, if you don't do a good job in setting up the right kind of repurchase agreement, you will need to do so within a certain period of time. If you don't do that, they could theoretically walk away with everything. So the agreements we like to do have the automatic default is that a repurchase occurs, whether or not you know, there's no need for an execution. Now, the question actually comes up whether or not that's enforceable in California. It, it may or may not be, but it's good to have in place. It keeps people honest. Uh, not filing 83B elections. Again, there's very little that you can do if you miss this deadline. It's 30 days after you, you have the stock that's issued, so you've got to get that on file. You have to file, uh, you have to send it into the IRS, and then you've got to file a copy with your tax return, and you should keep a copy with your accountant, and you should keep a copy with the attorneys who you're working with, and you should keep a copy for yourself. So the other thing, too, is when you send it into the IRS, Make sure you do it with some sort of, via some sort of mail that can verify that it got there. So you, know, you could FedEx it you know, or certified return receipt so you know it actually ended up there. Um, not paying attention to securities laws. So look, generally this is not too much of a problem for founders um, in the sense that Typically, founders are going to be participating in the organization either as an executive or a director. But every issuance of stock or every issuance of every security, whether it's stock, option, convertible debt, convertible equity, preferred stock, you got to comply with the securities laws. So either you need to make sure there's a proper exemption or you have to register. Typically, for founders, there are uh, a number of exemptions that they can use. But you know, you got to make sure you're doing this with your employees, too, right? So you bring on an employee, he or she is not going to be an, an officer, not going to be a director. You got to make sure that you find a securities exemption for them. If you have either an option plan in place or what's called sometimes a, uh, a restricted stock purchase plan, um, you, know, you can file and you can find some, some exemptions for those as well. But just going out there and, and handing out stock to employees is a big mistake. So don't do that. Um, one of the, the biggest pitfalls that sync companies is not documenting everybody's stake. Okay. <clears throat> so that frequently happens when um, you know, you're, you're good friends with your co-founder and you don't actually say, you, you're never comfortable enough to address the issue of who gets what and how big a slice it should be. And you're not comfortable with getting these formalities in place which could save your butt later. Um, another real issue is IP that resides in other entities. Does anyone know how that happens? Maybe you work for another company and you have uh, a confidential information and proprietary invention assignment agreement. Really easy to say. Um, basically, all the IP you do for this other company you know, purportedly goes to them. Now, generally in California, that isn't the case if you work on it at your own time, at home, with your own equipment. But if you're doing work you know, on your employer's computer or you're doing it during the employer's time, you may have real problems. Uh, additionally, if it's an idea that's sort of related to what your, employee, what your employer does and what you do for them more specifically, you can run into those problems too, um, you know, even if you do work on your own time. And uh, another issue, too, is universities, OK? Sometimes folks are in school, and sometimes they're basically the equivalent um, agreements that are in place there, especially if you're working like on a postdoc um, level or something like that. So <clears throat> those, are, those are real issues for ownership in the startup. And then, of course, tax issues. Now, we've talked about some of these, but federal, state, and local. And I also want to talk about employment. It's just some employment law issues. It's my understanding, you know, at least sort of at the federal level, and we're sort of speaking generally here, that there are exemptions to the wage and hour requirements for founders. Okay, generally, you know, if you have a, a, a specific percentage, which I think is 20, of a company or something, you don't necessarily need to comply with wage and law, hour laws for yourself. I'm unaware of any exemption in California. So your co-founders may technically need to be 
paid minimum wage. Otherwise, you're in violation of the wage laws. Now, how does this actually like, play out? Well, generally, when things are going well, it doesn't. Okay, but if you have an angry co-founder who leaves and they, you know, they think that they should be entitled to some or all of the equity that they are not getting because there was vesting in place, they may bring wage and employment law claims. So it's just sort of something to think about. Um, you know, on a similar issue, tax issues we mentioned before, getting that IP in early before it's valuable so that the company doesn't have to end up paying an, an astronomical amount of tax for it to acquire it. Making sure that if you're granting equity to employees, especially if you have an option plan in place, you've done a 409A valuation, so you know the value of the shares that you're granting to them so that they don't end up getting taxed at some point later by the IRS. Um, and then it's just some general tax issues, which is that um, everybody wants to be a contractor, or every company wants their, the folks who work for them to be contractors. The reason for that is so that they don't have to play, pay the employer side holding tax and a bunch of other stuff. That doesn't always work out well. And obviously, you know, that's pretty hot right now because that's one of the issues that's playing out in, Google, in uh, Uber as whether or, not the whether or not the drivers are employees. Um, they're obviously interested in it from the wage and hour perspective, which we just talked about. But also in there, Uber could, be, could have a really nasty tax bill if, if it turns out that they are employees for tax purposes and they should have been withholding. So I think that's it. I think I... Questions and comments? First question is uh, C-Corp. Um, I know it's preferred, but uh, in a lot of cases, when uh, you start a company, you're losing money. So how do you recapture that loss You know, for maybe for a few years, right? Right. Really good question. So as I said before, you know, what we're talking about is, is generalities here, and it's not specific advice. So generally, a C-Corp is, is the way to go. Not always, you know, sometimes if you have founders or previously successful entrepreneurs who have a high amount of income that's coming in, they want to be able to take those losses as they're being incurred each year and they can write them off personally, right? Because they get the K-1 and they're, they're able to deduct it. So that's one thing that we'll look at. Um, in terms of what it means for the C-Corp itself, basically all the money that you put in, ideally what you do is you, you want to capitalize the corporation. You want to put, put money into it by buying stock. And potentially, you want to lend the corporation money, OK? And you want to document that via note. So let's say you anticipate $50,000 of expenses the first year. Let's say you put in $10,000 for you know, equity. You put, you know, when you bought your stock, you put in $10,000. So you got forty dollars to go. You, you then put in forty. dollars You get a note on it. OK, that's like a promissory note. It's a promise that the company will repay you. As soon as the company starts making money, it can repay its debt holders first, OK? And then the money that gets repaid um, is generally, you know, the principal is not subject to tax. You've got to talk to your accountant and make sure that that works for you. But you get that money back first, more or less tax-free. The interest that accrues under the note would be taxed. Does that answer your question? But the company can still be running for a few years without taking any other outside, uh, you know, payment or revenue or investment. So the money you lend to it, you still not, you can still put it on, on a tax return. So how do you, unless the, the company liquidates and say, hey, I either fold or I go somewhere. In that event, you know, I can write, you know, in the tax return saying there's a liquidation event, but that may be for many years, right? Right. So you are right. The, you know, the money that gets put in there is is basically stuck. Is that kind of what you're asking right. about? Uh, but you want to document each dollar that it go, that goes in there, so you can get it back. When so when the company is making money, you can get it back tax free, basically. So would and, it make more sense if I start with the S corp and then do the conversion, do an election um, when it kind of makes money? Well, I guess it depends on your it depends on your income. You know, are you going to have? Um, do you have an income to put those losses against? OK, I don't know what that situation is, and we shouldn't go into that. S-Corps generally aren't going to work for venture-backed companies because S-Corps are only allowed to have uh, one type of stock. They're not allowed to have preferred stock, and institutional investors are going to want to have preferred stock. So you would, you would need to convert it over. The other real issue there goes back to the IP issue, and you need to work with a tax specialist on it. 
is that because an S Corp is a disregarded tax entity, it's as if that IP is owned by you personally. So the issue about moving the IP in when it's valuable may still come up, and you'd want to talk to your tax advisor about that. Okay. Hey, Jason. Um, this might be an obvious question, but I'll go ahead and ask anyways. So when we're talking about assigning shares of the company, let's say for the example you mentioned, we have 20 million shares in total, and you're, at first you assigned um, 10 million. Yep. Who gets or, or who owns the, the rest of the shares, like the 10 million remaining? And You're talking about the authorized but unissued shares? Yes. Okay. Yes. And how do you... Can you like um, add more shares to one founder, and how do you do that? Great question. Okay, so the so you said basically there are 10 million issued to the founders. Okay, that's all that counts in terms of ownership. The 10 million that are authorized but unissued, they don't really count for any purpose. You can maybe use them in the future. Maybe you'll want to grant some of them to employees who are coming in. You'll want to do a, like a restricted stock agreement with them. Um, can you bump up that number? Yes. Okay, you, you can you can you million. you can bump up the twenty million. Uh, you have to amend. You have to get the proper board and shareholder approval. But you can amend the certificate of incorporation and bump up the number of authorized shares. You want to do that. Um, you may need to do that for a whole host of reasons. Okay, but some of them might include also. You're going to have an institutional investor. They're going to want to have preferred stock. The bells and whistles that are in preferred stock typically also appear in the, um, in the certificate of incorporation. So you're going to need to, when you've worked out with them what it is they want, you've got to amend it to put that in there. So you'll be adding more shares kind of by doing that as well. And then a follow-up question. Whose approvals are required to issue more stocks out of the 20 million to the founder team? It's generally just the, the board, okay? I mean, there, there can be specific agreements and other things in the bylaws that, uh, you know, might change that. The other thing, too, or, or even the Articles of Incorporation that might change that, but typically it's just the board. The other thing, too, is that for every board issuance of any equity, excuse me, for any issuance of any equity, it needs to be done by the board. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not only must you get the board's approval, but, or not, Generally, it's only the board's approval you need, and you must get the board's approval. Okay, thank Even you. Even if it's just you. Even if you're the only person on the board. Yeah, thanks. Oh, all right. Yes. Hey, hey. so my question relates to nominal value of, uh, of stocks. Yes, par value. Yeah, so typically what I see is that the preferred stocks and the common stocks are, or common shares are valued at the same price. Yep. Let's say you said one tenth of a penny or a thousand, whatever. Yep. But I also saw situations where the, the preferred stocks are valued higher. Let's say ten times of what the common stocks is. Mm -hmm. Common stocks are. So my question is whether it uh, whether it uh, affects the overall number basically, or like uh, if 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 the preferred stocks are valued differently, whether they count uh, as a different number or as opposed to the common ones, or if it, uh, if it doesn't matter the the, the value or the, the the price. Okay, so there are a couple things going on here. Uh, it sounds like your question is, m is mostly focused on what's called par value, which is what's listed in the certificate of incorporation. Is yeah. that right? <clears throat> um, par value is really, okay, so par value is the minimum amount that you can issue stock for. So you can't issue stock for anything less than that. After the stock gets issued, it kind of doesn't matter what par value is, except for basically dividend purposes. So if the corporation is going to issue a dividend, you need to make sure that it has enough money basically in the bank to cover what would be the equivalent of the par value times the number of shares that are outstanding. If there's not enough money in the bank to basically do that, then you can't issue the dividend. To address your question a little bit more specifically, why would you do that? Well, I think, I think probably the circumstance... The, probably the circumstances where that was put in place is that whoever got the preferred was concerned that um, you know, they didn't want to have either they didn't want to have the preferred stock or other preferred stock being issued for less than a certain amount. And so that's why they put that in there. Typically, you don't see that um, just because you want to have as low a par value as possible so that you can issue dividends as sort of appropriate. I could go on actually on a, another sideway uh, seg. Uh, segue based off of that, but did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay.
Yep, Jim. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks for presenting. So let's assume that the company comes up with a, a body of IP that represents some saleable asset. Right. So the stock itself has a certain value. The IP portfolio has a certain value. Is there a mechanism to incorporate the IP value or the portfolio potentially as a licensing engine uh, into the evaluation of the company as a whole? And how would you uh, accommodate those two separate revenue streams or valuation? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. If I, I'm not sure I understand your question. I think I think what you're saying is the IP. So I have patents. I have patents. Yep. And those patents have value. Yep. The stock has value. Yep. Patents alone have value as well, separate from the stock. Right. So generally, okay. So it's talking really about what the value of the stock is. The value of the stock should really be what the value. If you take all the shares that are outstanding, that should be equal to the value of the company. How you value the company could be based off of a number of things, which might include um, the book value. That is, maybe there, maybe you have some hard assets or whatever that you could turn around and sell. Um, you know, to the extent you have IP that's tied up in those uh, in those patents. I mean, maybe there's a valuation for that, so maybe that would get added together. So you're saying the valuation of the company and the stock actually incorporates the value of the IP for the patents? Yes. Great. It should. It should. Um, but I guess there, there could be, you know, yes, it should actually, the value of the stock of the company should incorporate the value of the, of the IP that you're talking about. But that might not be the only value that's no. there, okay. right? Because there'd be values for teams and values of hard assets and, you know, like right. cars or, or whatever else you have in there. Okay, great. So, Perfect. okay. Thank you. Jason, for startups that are incorporating, uh, what would you recommend? Who would you recommend they go to for a corporation? Was this a softie? I'll, I'll it be, is yeah. a softie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you do like, and what size are your clients typically? Yeah. I mean, are they like Andreessen Horowitz funded? Are they like uh, angel funded? Are they like before angel funding? We have the whole panoply. So we have we have folks who are just forming okay so we do a lot of formation work yeah we have folks who are in the angel stage and then we have folks who are, are who are backed by venture capitalists and so, if a company's in a hurry to get uh formed do they have a long wait uh no we normally can accommodate that pretty quickly and and i have cards that are there and i think okay. rob put cards out somewhere and uh and and I have contact information right here. So I mean, I'd be happy to chat with anybody offline or online later at some other point in time too. Thank you. All right, thanks. Yes. All right, my question's uh, the election 83B that you talked about. Yes. Is that something that like, let's say I found an LLC. Yep. Uh, would, as a founder, I would also file that or is that only something for employees as options and that kind of thing or? So, uh, if you were to set up an, L an LLC mm -hmm. that had vesting over time, you definitely want to talk to a tax specialist about that. I think if you're, if you're um, I, I think it would come up if you had your ownership interest vesting over time, but we don't normally set them up like that, so I'm not sure I can give you a specific answer for that. If there was no vesting, if I just had the... Yeah, so, so the 83B only comes up if there's vesting. Okay. okay, so sometimes we have entities that are owned by one founder, and we don't actually put vesting in place for them because if they leave, the whole company goes under anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's no point in having vesting on them. But um, that said, things are always subject to change. So potentially, if they're going to get an institutional round, we have to get that vesting in place, you know, kind of later on. Additionally, um, you know, to the extent they bring in maybe not co-founders, but they bring in other folks who are going to help them, employees, consultants, and they're going to be getting some equity, and that equity is vesting over time. Those folks need to be thinking about A3B elections. Okay, so it would come into place when there's more people involved and when there's vesting involved. It's kind of When the ownership interest is subject to um, a right of repurchase, that's when it comes in play. Okay. I don't know. What right of repurchase? Oh, right of re so if, the, if there's a, a mechanism by which the ownership interest can be taken away, okay. that's when it comes into play. That rhymes. Okay. I'll think about that. Thank you. Yep. But not well. So it's kind of a, a similar follow-up. It's um, 
would it make more sense to simplify it such that when you are forming or you know incorporating with our external investor, you can just give common stock instead of over complicating it with you know some investing for the founders until um, it's demanded by you know some investor coming in. Well, I mean, I think it would, it would depend. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, I what think are the pros and cons? Yeah, so I guess it, it, it in part depends on how much stock each founder is going to get and what percentage of the company that represents. If you were all equals, okay, let's say you're splitting it three, let's say there are three of you and you're splitting it three ways. If you don't get vesting in place, if somebody leaves, um, they walk away with a third of the company. Uh, I guess maybe what you're saying is you could take you could take uh, my example, um, where we had four founders that each got 2.5 million shares that vested over. Let's make it five years to make the numbers round. So they'd be getting 500,000 shares a year. Are you asking basically <clears throat> if in that example um, they, rather than vesting those, those 2.5 million shares, you did a stock issuance every year, issuing each one of them 500,000 shares? Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, that that is another possibility. Yeah, so the so one of the issues with that is this. Going back to the rule that the, the IRS is going to tax you whenever you don't pay fair market value for something. If you give them all of the stock up front now, you can you know, you can do it That's for true. a thousandth of a penny, okay? But in four years maybe that stock is worth two bucks a share. So those founders will need to pay two dollars for 500,000 shares, and they need to each put in a million bucks. So right. that's, that's a drawback. Right. OK, all right, thank you. Yes. Hi, Jason. So what's the difference between ISO and NSO? <clears throat> oh, um, ISOs and NSOs. So you're talking about stock option plans, and um, you're talking about, um, so, so the ISO, and now, now since you put me on the spot, I can't. I'm trying to Incentive puzzle it. stock option? Yeah. Versus, uh, no, yeah. The um, ISOs are, are, are basically employee-related grants. Um, the benefits of them, so generally you want to do that because there's favorable tax treatment, OK? And the reason for that is that the IRS wants to have, you know, acknowledges that the employees who are going to be receiving them um, <laughs> they get favorable tax treatment versus the ends and there's a limit to them I can't remember what it is I want to say you can only grant maybe or vest a hundred thousand dollars worth of them a year um, incentive stock options versus uh, non statutory uh, stock options and that's that's what sorry I'm and, blocking on the name uh, it's non qualified stock options so something like that right but do you have to pay taxes on them every year or like when you vest so and I'm not a tax guy, and we work with tax guys on this. My, my recollection is the ISOs you probably do not need to, but ENSOs you do. And so that's one of the things that you, that's one of the reasons why folks want to try and fit into the ISO bucket. Yep. Yep. Um, my name is Ned. Hi, Ned. Um, my question is about a um, following situation. Um, startup formed um, by three people. Um, um, one is an angel investor and two other co-founders. The angel investor prefers an LLC because um, any, any money that's spent by the startup um, is tax deductible for mm -hmm. the investor. Mm -hmm. um, the um, two other co-founders um, have um, share equal shares, three-way equal shares. Mm -hmm. They invest immediately and the other two co-founders um, get paid as employees. The question is, um, what are the landmines or surprises if this um, LLC is um, converted to a C corp, um, or it goes out for um, acquisition, um, particularly on on the um, non-investing co-founders. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I mean, I think uh, you you you'd want to get a. So let me take a step back. Um, there's nothing wrong with LLCs. Okay, it's just typically they're not the the right fit for tech startups or for emerging growth companies. Now, there are certain, certain circumstances, which I kind of even pointed out earlier. Maybe you have somebody who's participating who has uh, a good income and wants to be able to take advantage of tax losses, which it sounds like that's what's going on here. Um, 
The real issues that come up and you've got to work with a good tax specialist before conversion is, um, as I said before, making sure that the IP is properly um, in the other assets. You want to make sure that there's not going to be a nasty tax bill upon conversion because I don't, you know, it's a pass through tax entity. So I think for ownership purposes, it's as if each of the individuals own a third of the assets. And we're kind of talking about moving those assets. So if it's that way, the IRS sort of perceives it as transferring, moving to the C Corp is as if transferring it to another person. So you got to pay fair market value for it. So bottom line, you got to work with a tax specialist for either a conversion or for an exit. Um, but it's not, you know, it, it may very well be the right move for you guys. I, I don't really know what the circumstances are. Does that answer your question or? Sure. Yeah. I mean, some of the other issues that come in there are, um, it's, it's frequently difficult to build out an emerging growth company on the skeleton of an LLC. It's not impossible. But what some of the issues are is that it, LLC doesn't naturally have stock, right? You have a percentage ownership in, in the company. So you have to create what's called you know, either phantom stock or, or stock units that basically mimic the quality of stock. And the issue kind of with that is, is really mostly tax driven. And you got to have tax specialists who take a look at, um, at everything that you do and all the equity that you sort of issue to make sure that you don't blow the tax status. That's basically what the real problem is. It costs a fortune to run from a tax perspective. Are, are there any taxes before conversion or, or uh, selling the company? I'm not the person to ask for that. I, I, know, I know a couple of tax specialists. I'd be happy to refer you to them. Hi, my name is Shannon. Um, yep. So my question is with regards to the uh, control and voting rights of the shares. Yes. So uh, specifically in the context of uh, pre-money and post-money valuation, yeah. so how does that affect the control and voting rights of a corporation? Is it in proportion to the way valuation is done on shares, or is it something else altogether? That is a wonderful question, um, and I could put up a whole other presentation on it. but. <clears throat> I mean, the short and simple answer is it's basically what you can negotiate um, during that round of financing. So when we, you know, it sounds like we're, what we're basically talking about is uh, a venture round, okay, or a Series A round. And what what comes up is you know, those investors are going to want to have representation on the board, okay. They're going to want to have um, you know various voting agreements either among themselves and potentially even with the founders. So it's kind of what you can negotiate there. On a related note, I get frequent questions from, from founders who ask, well, is there something I can do prophylactically to protect myself? Maybe, maybe like what Facebook did and have sort of you know, uh, 10x voting rights or whatever in if for the founder's stock, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is, it is certainly possible to set that up. Um, one of the issues is, is that you, in order to not lose it during the negotiation with the, with the money folks, you got to be really hot. So the real question is, you know, how hot are you? Are you going to be able to maintain that going on? Or is it going to be subject to a renegotiation? Or are you going to have to fix it later, which will cost you more? You know, it costs you more to set it up now. And then to take it out is sort of a waste of funds and time. Right, but in a very general situation where uh, you're just getting investment, maybe for seed funding, just yeah. very, very general then uh, you won't be negotiating like, oh, separate class of shares for different voting rights. So in this general situation, does voting rights also, like, uh, does, like is in proportion to the way the valuation is being done? So when I think of a seed round, I, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of, of a round that's done typically between, you know, either, either by convertible debt or convertible equity for up to basically a million dollars. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, oh. we can use that for an example. Okay. Yeah. Well, typically that's one reason why we we so not only does the convertible debt or equity avoid the issue of valuing the company, but convertible debt and convertible equity don't have voting rights yeah. inherent in them like stock would. You can build them into the agreement, but they don't naturally have that in there. So typically there wouldn't be any voting rights and you wouldn't be giving up that control issue there. But if you're, if, if you're doing like a, either a common, you know, if for some reason and nobody does this and I don't recommend doing it, but if you were doing a common round or if you were doing, let's say, like a, um, a series seed round, 
you know, which is basically between one and two million. It's basically like a miniature Series A. Mm -hmm. We're doing a Series A round. Um, those shares have voting rights. And then there can be, especially in the preferred round, either the Series C or the preferred, they can have special bells and whistles, which would require that you get their approval before you do something, or they get to vote as a separate class of stock before you can do something like change the um, corporate charter or something along those lines. Great, uh, that answers my question. Thanks. Okay, cool. Yes, sir. Thank you uh, for a, a fine presentation. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, my question is this, we've formed our Delaware. Uh, we've issued restrictive stock purchase agreements about half of them have come back, and the other half seem to be kind of floating out mm -hmm. there. And uh, there's a frequent call by our lawyers to various people to go ahead and get your agreements in. Yep. Well, as the company progresses and different people show up to meetings, and some are more enthusiastic than others, our perception of their worth and contribution to the company changes. Yep. So as we uh, I think it through, maybe we're not in the mood to sign those restricted stock purchase agreements after all. Yep. So the question is really, what sort of an obligation do we have to people that we have issued restricted share purchase agreements to but haven't signed ourselves? Practical question. But. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, from a you know, practical answer is all it does is create uncertainty and it allows issues to kind of hang out there, which um, may never rise you know, that ugly head may never rise, or it may. Um, and, and the issue kind of where it comes up is maybe not initially, but if you're going to have, um, you know, if you're going to have, if the company's going to have an exit, um, there's going to be a diligence period by the, by the buyer, and they're going to want to see every single stock re uh, restricted stock purchase agreement. Um, and they will ask, why is this one not signed? Why is that one not signed? Um, and they may ask for sign off on it. Uh, Additionally, I mean, the same kind of thing happens when you're doing uh, venture rounds. There's a diligence period. So uh, it creates uncertainty because, you know, you can still be bound by an agreement even if you don't sign it. There's obviously an argument that you're not. But, you know. So it's perhaps just, uh, a proactive action along the lines of we're essentially taking that agreement back. And, um, you know, seeing what the reaction is, just to get it out on the table before uh, a next it. round of funding or something of that effect to see what we have. Yeah, I mean, well, it sounds like you have counsel, so I would, you know, I'm just going to give you general answers, not specific. I just wanted to see what your response would be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I would defer to your counsel because they'll know more facts about whatever the situation is, as well as the fact that it's a, it's a personality issue too with the folks. I'm sure. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Jason. Hi. Um, my name is Alvin. I have a startup, and it's about a month old. Okay. And uh, we have a few founders that uh, are working on this part-time, and just want to know um, when is a good time to incorporate and when to issue shares. So my, my rule of thumb is um, when it's more than just one, mm -hmm. it's time to think about incorporating. When it's more than just one and a whiteboard, it's time to start thinking about incorporating. Um, I say more than just one because when you have more than one, you have issues of who's getting what percentage. And if you don't get that drilled or dialed in, in you know, initially, you may not be able to ever kind of fix or figure out what that, what that answer is, you know, especially if somebody walks away. Mm -hmm. They might say, well, we worked on this together. I have 50%. Mm -hmm. um, and I say even when it's one, if you're beyond the whiteboard stage, you need to at least think about incorporating because of the tax consequences of moving the IP in. Um, you know, you don't want to have a tax bill for moving the IP in. So sound, sounds like you're, you know, you're probably there. OK. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, what's your opinion on caps or early, um, early financing? Yep. Uh, it's what you can negotiate. Um, obviously, you know, if you can do uncapped, if you're hot enough to do uncapped, that's fantastic. We see a lot of caps. I think you know they were trending up for a while. They were trending up to sort of maybe seven or eight, um, but you know typically we see between I think five and seven, and then sometimes up to ten. And they're just um, does, it, does everyone here know what caps are? So we're talking about convertible debt or convertible equity. 
<clears throat> and we talked about for convertible debt or convertible equity, there is a discount rate. Okay, and so basically what the cap does is, and take a step back. The seed investors who are buying or who are uh, purchasing convertible notes or convertible equity, um, they're taking the most risk, right? It's basically when you are at your most vulnerable, you're going from kind of the idea stage to maybe a prototype stage-ish. And so they're, they're really taking the most money. So theoretically, they should be rewarded accordingly. Sometimes a discount of, let's say, 20% or 30% is really not enough, especially if the money that they give you basically allows you to build a company that, if they give you $500,000 and they allow you to build a $20 million company, well, then they should get rewarded a bit more than maybe 20%. And so that's, that's what the concept is behind the cap. And you know, we see them, we're fine with them, and kind of the market trend, I would say, is between five and eight. And I've seen people do uncapped notes, too. I mean, we've done uncapped. So if you can do it, you should do it. Thank you very much. Yep. Hi, this is Ben. Thank you so much for the lovely presentation. Uh, my question is very clear because startups are very new. Yep. Uh, so, like, uh, we in a co founder, we started this company uh, almost like six months ago. Yep. Uh, we recruited only through the people we knew. Okay. We used to a college network, to a work network. Mm -hmm. Now we have a great team. We have a small team of 10 people. Yep. Uh, two co founders. And so, what is the best way uh, to reward the people who join us early? Uh, if they're heading for a seed round, so what is the best way to like get how much equity should we give them, and uh, like so how do you maintain their expectations as well? Yep. And uh, yeah. So you've already so you've already incorporated. Yeah. You've, and and you, the founders have received stock. Yeah. Okay. And the and you have eight other employees or consultants. Yes. And have they gotten any equity thus far? Uh, no. And have you made any promises of equity to them? Not really. We were really working and focusing on the product. So this was a non-revenue-based product. Now we're aiming for some traction and some more revenue models now. So have, have they? Um, they're all, all on salary basis. Yes. They're all on salary. Okay. So and cash has been sufficient, and you yes. have you have IP assignment agreements in place. Yeah. Well, um, I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think uh, in in the round of financing that you're considering raising, tell me a little bit about that. Raising about 200k for now. Okay. Fund. Okay. And we, of course, they've been with us, and they're very good team, so we, of course, want to keep them around. We yeah. We want to reward them as well. It's not just for uh, the salary. So, what is the best way for a team so that we can we will grow the startup on this team? Yeah. So, uh, how do we, you know, justify? Well, I, I would consider getting the, I would consider getting a stock option plan slash um, restricted stock. Uh, uh, purchase plan in place as well, and maybe you'll grant them some restricted stock, which would vest over time. Um, if they've been, the issue with the options, as I said before, is then you got to pay money for a 409A valuation, which would probably be three to 5K or something, which is fine and doable, but you need to do that. Um, I mean, if they've been, if you got, if they've been working for cash, and you guys have had the cash, then, I mean, they, you've been taking really most, if not all of the risk, and so, I mean, I would, I would weigh that with you know what it is that they have done, um, and I would also think that it's always easier to give more later than to take it away. So, um, you know, typically in a stock option pool, we would see roughly um, if we look if we think about the numbers of um, let's say the ten million, right? And let's say there are two co two co-founders with. Um, Let's say 3.5 million each. We'd see roughly two million in shares reserved for that. So uh, yeah, I mean, I would give them. I would think about giving them some, some either options or restricted stock. Right. What specifically? I'm not going to say because, as I said before, I, I don't really think it's. Um, there's not like a bright line rule or test that you can use. But those are the things I would think about. Um, I mean, the fact that you can, you've been able to work with them and they've been getting cash. And that's been working for them. I think is good. So it's really more of like a bonus. More than anything else, you know, if if, if they're not getting cash, um, well, then obviously they need to get a lot of equity, and then you also maybe have some employment issues. But, Thank you. yep, yes. Okay, I've got some questions. One is, uh, it's almost the end of the year. Uh, it's, next year is you know three weeks away. Should you incorporate right now, or wait till January? 
Well, I mean, I think it's, it sort of depends there. Uh, I mean, it really just depends on your circumstances. Uh, if you have something that's really hot and pressing and you need a company, then yes, you should do it now. There are obviously, um, when you file for a corporation, you've got to pay taxes on the state of incorporation as well as here. And, um, you know, you may be able to save yourself a thousand bucks if you wait three weeks. So, do, uh, so Delaware, I think, is roughly, and don't quote me on this, but it's roughly like 350 bucks a year to like run a corporation <clears throat> at, at the minimum. It can go up from there, obviously, like if you have a really large corporation, but the minimum, i.e., if you're just like a really baby startup, you're going to be paying like 350 bucks. The minimum here in California is 800 bucks. So you're looking at a, sort of 1100 right there. You know, if you wait three weeks, maybe you can save yourself some okay. thousand bucks. Um, another question. You put out a lot of things to look out for. I don't know about the rest of the people here, but I've got my head wrapped around getting this company up and going and the IP and things like that. Uh, you've raised questions in areas that have, have no idea where to even start going to look for the answers. You know, we start the company, found it. Do we come back to you and say, hey, what do we do about this? You know, how, how do we get answers to some of the questions that you've raised? Yeah. Is it you? Uh, I mean, I, yes. I mean, most of the questions I can raise, I can answer. I can't necessarily answer them in five minutes. But yes, I think basically what you should do is legal and tax are issues that are going to be issues for startups, for any business for that matter. And so you need to get a good team in place of trusted advisors you can work with. We do that. We work with the startups all the time. We enjoy working with startups. Um, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you, you know, afterwards, or we can set up a time to talk, or anybody in the room, not, not just Paul. Um, but yeah, getting the right team in place of, of advisors who've done it before is really what you need to do, because nobody can keep up with all this stuff, you know. It's not your responsibility to, to know everything. Nobody can do that. Yeah. Well, let's hear it for Jason. <laughs>